Okay, so today we are looking at is globalization a solution to world poverty and this is another article by Dr. Luke Martel. This time I put uh, a different picture of Dr. Luke Martel. Last time I put a picture of him with a big beard. This time he's a little more clean shaven. So let's have a look at what he has to say. He begins by telling us that um, academic commentators, especially those who are based in Europe uh, and in the West, particularly North America, etc., see globalization um, as uh, equalizing and democratizing. Members of the educated elites in developed countries are preoccupied with their own lives, complaining these are not good enough or that others are better off. However, global inequality is the main reason to take an interest in globalization, he seems, seems to suggest, he argues. There was a quite a remarkable, small but remarkable protest today uh, for the janitors here in uh, Lums. And uh, the protest was against the fact that they were being, their jobs were being outsourced to another company. Uh, 2012, this issue is university. Mein chal raha hai. And uh, students have come and students have gone. Students have gone on to do their MAs and PhDs and so on. But the janitor issue, sadly, remains where it was nearly a decade ago. So that's very sad. But that also, interestingly, is very much tied to our course material here. Because as you studied in the last class, outsourcing, offshore outsourcing to or zyada, but outsourcing generally is very much part of the new way in which business is done in a globalized world. So what you're seeing in the context of your own university with respect to the outsourcing of janitorial work is also very much part of globalization uh, and the economic changes that it has brought about. Internationally, in academia, debates are often between those who are very pro-globalization, very strong globalizers who think that this is the best thing to do because it creates for efficient markets, it creates for more greater efficiency, it, uh, and in the long run, it creates for, it leads to uh, you know, um, economic growth and economic output, and that is to the welfare of everyone. On the other hand are those who argue or uh, look more favorably upon state interventionism or semi-protectionist or even all-out protectionist sort of policies. They argue often that free trade would be good if it was truly and really free trade, which it is not. And for that reason, they reject globalization or at least partially reject globalization. Poverty and inequality, as I asked you in your quiz, are two different things. One, of course, is, the sta is a measure of the standard of living, the absolute standard of living of people, and that's measured by $1.25 a day in, in, uh, in any given country uh, in terms of purchasing power parity. The other is inequality, which is, of course, the distribution of wealth in a society, the distribution of wealth and incomes in a society. And that's, although I didn't ask that, that's often measured by the Gini coefficient, which looks at uh, various segments of society in relation to each other. There are also other kinds of inequality that we don't sometimes talk about, but we ought to. Income is not the only kind of inequality. There is inequality of education. Uh, there is inequality created by unequal access to health care. There may be inequality created by the fact that society may have uh, attitudes towards women which are discriminatory. They may even have laws towards women which are discriminatory. There's also a kind of inequality, we can talk about racial e inequality which has existed for, in many countries in the 20th century. And although it doesn't legally exist uh, in many parts of the world today, uh, there may still be many, many, many attitudes towards people of a different racial group that, continues to ex that continue to exist. So there may also be information inequality, in particular what we call the digital divide, the fact that certain people are connected to this flow of information and others are not. And economic inequality you understand, and of course there may be cultural or political inequality. Some people may be disenfranchised, they may or may not be allowed to vote, they may or may not be allowed to express their opinion. Um, and there may be cultural inequality in the sense that some people may be treated as lower class citizens. China and India figure very prominently in this question and debate about poverty and inequality. Why? Well, together they have about a third of the population of the globe, firstly, and they are rapidly changing. They are really transforming. So out of 7.35 billion people, China is 1.37, India is 1.31. That's massive. And both these countries, 
are transforming in very big ways. Transforming in ways that result in changes at the global level. You saw one example of this in the last class, for example, China's industrialization, India also, its growth, et cetera, is fueling oil prices, which are going up, et cetera. So that's only one of many other examples that we can give. So in this chapter, we are focusing on the poor. In this module, in fact, we're focusing on inequality and poverty. So neoliberal economists often argue that third world countries should trade their way out of poverty. And you may have heard the familiar, uh, you know, cliche that if you give a man something to eat, he'll only eat for a day, but if you teach a man how to fish, you know, he'll continue to live for a lifetime. And that's become kind of the cliche that neoliberals always use, by which they mean, look, we're not going to give aid, we're not going to give assistance to third world countries, we're going to give trade. And through trade, they'll be better off, et cetera, et cetera. So trade should be their way out of poverty. This idea that third world, the problem with third world countries, the reason for their underdevelopment is because somehow or the other the markets are too constrained. Somehow or the other capital isn't allowed to move, investment isn't really allowed to come in. It, the, that third world countries are not really friendly to business. Uh, and that's the real reason why they, these third world countries are stuck in a state of underdevelopment. So that, that, that idea is, uh, and what to do about it, is referred to as the Washington Consensus. And that is, we will give money to people, we are ready to give financial assistance, sorry, not to people, but to countries, provided they are also willing to create a more uh, pro-business or business-friendly environment. So that means that our assistance comes with certain conditions, uh, certain policies have to be accepted, uh, certain structural adjustments have to be made, and so on. And these include, the three main things that these include are financial deregularization, number two, trade liberalization, which means tariffs and barriers need to be removed, and finally, denationalization or privatization. Uh, and accompanying this is also often a lowering of government spending on subsidies or on other social provisions. So basically what this means is we want open markets, we want free markets, we want uh, competition, and all restrictions that inhibit business ought to be lifted. Governments and companies in rich countries tend to strongly support this argument of free trade. And economic, economics departments also strongly tend to support this idea, probably including the one here at LUMS with the exception of Khalid Mir and maybe Turab and a few other people, most of the economists here will also say the markets automatically stabilize and take uh, society to an optimum solution. That's what we need to do in order to ignite the switch of industrialization in third world countries. But this Washington consensus has also been severely criticized, both by insiders as well as by, anti -global, by the anti-globalization movement. George Soros, Joseph Stiglitz, Stiglitz in particular uh, is a, you know, a strident critic of uh, what globalization has done and a, quite a brilliant critic, in fact, I'd say. So they argue, uh, not just these people, but the, the people who oppose the Washington consensus, that neoliberal policies have resulted in higher unemployment, poorer public services, higher cost of living, loss of protection for home businesses, lower public spending, and the end of price restrictions, which have made people's lives much, much worse. In fact, they sometimes even go to the extent of saying that this is nothing but a new form of imperialism. For example, help for developing countries from the group of eight, that is the G8, highly industrialized countries, is always conditional on liberalization and supposedly democratization, which often obviously means that regimes have to be brought into place, which are pro-business and pro-international capital. So what is the result on global poverty? Income can be a good indicator of poverty, although it's not the only indicator, because when we're looking at the concept of poverty, we're looking at deprivation overall deprivation. But income, if you don't have income, you will be deprived of education. If you don't have income, you'll be deprived of healthcare. If you don't have income, you'll be deprived of stuff, goodies, things, food, all of those things, right? So income tends to be the most uh, u utilized mechanism to judge deprivation, i.e. poverty. So one indicator is uh, to judge how many people are living at $1.25 a day in terms of purchasing power parity. That means the person in Pakistan is not necessarily earning $1.25. That means that the person in Pakistan is earning what 
if you were living in America, what you could buy with $1.25, the person in Pakistan could buy with the, that uh, amount of money. So that 1.25 has to be converted into purchasing power parity terms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It might come to a lot less, and so on. And that was one of the reasons that this actually measures not just poverty, but it would be correct to say that this measures extreme poverty. Because, I mean, imagine you're living in the United States and you earn $1.25 a day. Uh, you know, an ordinary burger at McDonald's or Burger King or whatever costs $6 or $7, even if you want it with chips and so on, sometimes up to $10 or whatever, right? So um, $10 meal would be a pretty, uh, you know, sort of average meal, not an expensive one. So $1.25 a day means you can't buy that even, right? That's like... Or in the, in the context of the US, that's not an expensive meal at any level. So this is not poverty. This is extreme poverty. So um, what we ex observe about that is that uh, the number of people living in this kind of extreme poverty between 1820 and 1980 actually increased. And between 1990 and 2011, the number of people living on less than $1.25 fell from $1.9 billion to $1 billion. That's a pretty dramatic fall, and what we discover about that is that most of that fall, uh, two-thirds of that fall, is as a consequence of China, and a lot of a, a, a rest of that fall is as a consequence of other countries, mainly in East Asia. So mainly the poverty reduction is occurring in China and East Asia, uh, not so much in the rest of the world. That means that as we enter the 21st century, we are now in the third decade of the 21st century, there are a billion people out of 7 billion people, there are billion people in extreme poverty. That means $1.25 a day bhi wo nahi kama pa rahe. So that's quite scandalous. The proportion living below this amount changed from 36% to 15%. That's a pretty dramatic thing. But it may be misleading because most of that, as I told you, is occurring in only one region of the world. One in seven people in the world still lives in po below the po ex poverty line, that is in extreme poverty. In the least developed countries, 46% still live in extreme poverty, about 400 million people. Moreover, if you raise the poverty line to $2.5 a day, that, num that more than doubles the number of people in poverty. Many people would see even a purchasing power of $2.5 a day as excluding plenty of people who are suffering real poverty and hardship. Uh, and I think that's... Uh, you know, that's quite true, and I think that's quite valid to say that, that um, even $2.5 a day is not a lot of money. You can understand, you can imagine. All right, so what's going on in Africa, which continues to be um, a place of extreme poverty? Um, extreme poverty has fallen from 65 to 51 percent, but that still means half the people in Africa are in extreme poverty. Extreme poverty means you don't have enough to eat. Okay, so let's, let's be clear about that. Under five mortality has halved in developing regions since 1990. So, okay, let me just pause slightly over here. There are a lot of numbers over here now. All right, we're going to go through a lot of data and statistics. But, uh, and sometimes, you know, people get turned off. This is too much data and too many numbers. But stay with me, stay focused, because the data is actually very, very important. You must have some rough idea of what we're talking about when we talk about poverty, inequality, and and so on. So some rough idea of where it exists, what is the scale, what are the numbers should be with you if you're really going to you know, look at this question in any detail. So under five mortality has halved in developing regions since 1990 from 100 to 47 deaths per 1,000 live births. That's good. But in sub-Saharan Africa, it stands at 86 per 1,000 births, about 3 million in 2015. Uh, or half the world's death under the age of five and double the rate for the rest of the world. So half the world's deaths of infants occurs in this region of the world that is in sub-Saharan Africa. In sub-Saharan Africa, five in ten of the population, five in ten of the population is in extreme poverty. The number of people in poverty in sub-Saharan Africa have risen from 290 million to 415 million. So actually, the num even though the proportion of people who are in poverty has gone down. The number of people in poverty actually has gone up. The number of people in poverty has gone from 290 million to 415 million. So that's pretty, uh, that's pretty severe, that's pretty extreme. In Sub-Saharan African Africa, 23% of the people, that is more than one in five, are undernourished. That's nearly a quarter of people 
who are basically very, very thin. While the hunger rate has fallen, the numbers unnourished have grown from uh, 44 million since 1990. Uh, sorry, have grown by 44 million since 1990. In Central Africa, the number of undernourished people has doubled since 1990. And in Western Asia, the proportion of undernourished uh, uh, people in poverty is also on the rise. So there are regions of the world where the absolute number of undernourished, poor and hungry people has been going up in this entire period of globalization. One in nine people in the world, that is about 795 million people do not have enough to eat and are undernourished. This is a scandal. Let me say, this is a scandal because, to you know, because there is more than enough being produced uh, in terms of food in the world. There's an amazing book that I read in college called Food First, uh, which, is, which changed my life. And now there's an institution, Food First Foundation or institution it's called. You can look it up on the internet if you're connected, etc. cetera. Um, and they look at this question of how much food is produced and how many people are in poverty. And they, they have the data to show that the amount of food production has been growing exponentially, far, far faster than the growth in the population. So the whole Malthusian idea that um, you know, a population has a geometric proportion and uh, resources grow at an arithmetic proportion is not proven to be correct. In fact, population has been growing, but in some countries, of course, it's also been tapering off. So particularly in Europe, it stopped growing. And moreover, food has been growing at many times the rate at which population has been growing. And still there is uh, hunger. So food is wasted and thrown away in many parts of the world. Let me tell you a little story. When I went to college in the United States of America, near near my college poncha tha, and I was very excited, etc. And I went to the, uh, to the cafeteria and so on. It was my third or fourth day or something, very new. Uh, everything was new to me, obviously. It was a new country. It was a different country and so on. And we were not as clued in to you know, America as perhaps you guys are today. So everything was new to me. So suddenly, uh, we're eating food. Every, you know, everything is going normal, uh, some good food there, etc. Suddenly, one student gets up and says and shouts, food fight, and picks up some food and throws it at somebody else. And pretty soon, the whole cafeteria erupts in students picking up food and throwing it at each other. And I obviously felt sick to the stomach. And I picked up my food and I walked out. Uh, it was really shocking to see how much food could be waste, thrown, uh, wasted, um, uh, you know, uh, when there are so many hungry people in the world. In the world's least developed countries, 25% do not have enough to eat. A quarter of the people do not have enough to eat. In sub-Saharan Africa, 23% of people, more than one in five, are again undernourished. So extreme situation. There are also, of course, child deaths from preventable diseases. Most child deaths under the under five are from preventable diseases, such as pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria. Globally, deaths under five are twice as high in the poorest as in the richest households. So the poor really are dying because of poverty. It's not just that they're suffering because they couldn't buy a new phone or something. They're literally dying because of it. You have UNICEF, which tells you a child under 15 dies every five seconds around the globe, around the world. The United Nations Development Program created the Human Development Index to look at deprivation. That looks at three factors. Those are income, healthcare, and education. Health is assessed by life expectancy at birth. Education is measured by the number of years of schooling for adults aged 25 years and more, and expected years of schooling for children of school entering age. And finally, standard of living is measured by GNP per capita, which is a simp relatively simpler method. So then HD HDI uses the logarithm of income to reflect the diminishing importance of income with increasing GNI. So the, it's, it's on a logarithmic scale. Also, the scores for the three HDI dimensions indices are then aggregated into a composite index using ge the geometric mean rather than an arithmetic mean. So where numbers rise in exponential proportions, their geometric mean is a better method, uh, mathematically speaking, than just looking at the average. You can look at the formula of a geometric mean, but basically you multiply everything and then you divide that number by the number of terms that you have. Sorry, you don't divide it. You square, you, you um, underroot it by the number of terms that you have. 
So more than 2.2 billion people are living in multi-dimensional poverty according to the Human Development Index. And despite the fact that you can even have a private company that can chart a space flight and you have such high technology in the world today and such incredible productive capacity, this continues to be a scandal, this continues to be the case. China is a very different story. Here is how extreme poverty has been falling in China. This is 1990. If you go a little further back, it goes, uh, this is the same, it's pretty much the same trend. You can see that it's incredibly dramatic. Uh, the fall in poverty is absolutely phenomenal. The share of people living on less than $1.25 a day has fallen from 58%, that's almost 60% of the people in China had less than $1.25 a day, to 7.9%. Uh, this is across East Asia and in the Pacific region. It's happening in China, it's also happening in Vietnam. Nearly two-thirds of the reduction in undernourishment since 1990 has been in China. In fact, the poverty reduction in China is so huge that you will often see in UNDP statistics that they will have one table and aggregate data with China, and they will have the same table and aggregate data, et cetera, without China. Because it is such a huge outlier, it's such a big country and such a huge outlier that including or excluding it means changing the whole way in which global trends can be understood, or the whole global trend is changed by the inclusion or exclusion of one country. The World Bank also states that China has lifted something to the extent of 850 million people out of extreme poverty in the last four decades. 850 million people means, you know, that's like four times the size of Pakistan. Four Pakistans they have lifted out of poverty. It's quite remarkable. Life expectancy. Between 1990 and 2013, life expectancy has been getting better. Yes? So how, how, how um, that's a good question, uh, and it'll take me into a long tangent. Um, but um, they did it with a combination of state as well as market mechanisms that were highly directed and controlled by the state. Um, so they also invited a lot of investment. But they also um, uh, did a lot of joint ventures. They also had a lot of state, pr pr public-private partnerships. They had a lot of variety of different ways and means in which they engaged with globalization. And they went about it in a very smart way. That's a very sh brief answer, very short answer. Tafseel se bhi mein jawab dunga aapko. But for the moment, let's just keep this in mind, that they really did achieve what we could consider an economic miracle both in terms of growth as well as in terms of reduction of extreme poverty. Although inequality in China has grown, has also grown, okay? How they did it is a big debate. A lot of the economists will tell you they did it because they opened themselves up to the world. They allowed foreign investment in, they lowered their trade and tariff barriers, et cetera, et cetera. That's how they did it. They allowed globalization. Globalization is the reason why China industrialized. Is that really the case? You'll see in this reading as well as in subsequent readings, that there's a very big debate about that, okay? So what's happening with life expectancy? It has become better from 64 years to 71 years, but in Africa, life expectancy is still in the 50s. It's at 58, um, increased only from 50 to 58. In America, as in Europe, the life expectancy is almost uh, 20 years longer. If you're American, you get to have 20 more years in this world uh, at 77 and 76. Um, in some African countries, your chance of living after 50 are not good. In Lesotho, for example, it is 50. In Central African Republic, it is 51. In Chad, Angola, and Dumek, and the DRC, it is 52. In Sierra Leone, it is 46. In Africa, 2,669 2, people. There are 2,669 people per 100,000 people um, living with HIV and AIDS. So AIDS is really... In the 80s, we had this imagination that AIDS was an American thing, you know, Americans, uh, because of the movies and stuff, right? You had a lot of films about AIDS and so, AIDS and so on. But actually, vast majority uh, or a significant portion, portion at least of people with HIV AIDS is actually in Africa. So the comparable figure is 500 per 100,000, and two, only 229 in Europe. So you can see what a huge difference is, it is. There are 10 times more people uh, with HIV and AIDS in Africa than they are per population than they are in Europe. 
And here you can see the, uh, this is a good chart to see life expectancy. This is, of course, 85 and plus, Australia, Europe, and Canada. Uh, and then you have uh, 75 years and above, and you can see these are the regions of the world that have that. And then over here, you have 55 years and so on. And you see most of Africa is in that. Most of Asia, Russia is still better off. South Asia is over here in the mid-60s, et cetera. So very unequal world, sad to say. But this data doesn't tell you the whole story because if you are rich and in Pakistan, then you do live up to the, your 70s and 80s, etc. But if you are poor and um, in Europe, you could still live a longer life than if you're poor and in Pakistan or poor and in sub-Saharan Africa. Gender. So uh, Martel first uh, tells us that um, uh, often when we look at the globalization, we tend to forget, we tend to not disaggregate for gender. We look at these aggregate statistics, but we must do that as well to understand what, access, what, what is happening with respect to women. 48% of women have access to employment, and this is globally improving. Uh, but in North Africa, female access to employment is only 19%, the same as in 1990. And by the way, um, with respect to Pakistan as well, the um, uh, female labor participation ratio is very low, uh, about 22%, etc. It is at 21% in Southern and Western Asia, 34% in Southern Africa, 50% of working age women are in the workforce compared to 77% of men, and they earn 24% less than men. Seats held in national parliaments by women have increased um, from 14%, uh, but they still only hold about 22% of seats. Only in Rwanda and Cuba are women overrepresented in national parliament. So well done, Rwanda, and well done, Cuba. They have more women in parliament than they have in the country, which is great. Also, <clears throat> we uh, should think about the fact that around the world, women bear a disproportionate burden of unpaid household work. So they're doing a lot of work which is not even accounted for in the economy. You can see that uh, the uh, purple represents women and the green lines represent men. And that's Middle East and South Asia and Eastern Europe, Latin America, Europe, East Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa and North America respectively. In every part of the world, unpaid labor is mainly done by women. Another very big concern, of course, is climate change. Climate change um, <clears throat> accentuates poverty and deprivation. Here is the average temperature of the globe from 1880 till 2020. And you can see very clearly that there's a trend for this temperature going up. Here's another graph where you go all much further back in history. You can see global fluctuations. And then you can see our period in history where there's a huge spike in temperature. This spike, people consider, is man-made. It does not accord to anything we've seen previously. And this is man-made. This is because of what we've been doing and putting into the environment. Question? No, Acha, OK. <laughs> Your hand was going up and down. I was like, <laughs> OK, maybe there's a question. All right, so um, 48 least developed countries in the world, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, have a population of 800 million or 12% of the world's population. They produce 0.64% of the world's carbon emission, but suffer the effect of climate change especially harshly. China, 29%, USA, 15%, EU, 11% produce over half the world's CO2 emissions, followed by individual countries such as India, Russia, Japan, Germany, South Korea, Canada. Of these, taking into account population, Australia and the USA produce over 18 tons of CO2 per person, Germany, 9.6, and China, 5.3. The least developed countries produce 0.2 tons per person. Again, the amount of CO2 produced by the developed countries is far higher, obviously, than the amount of CO2 produced by the poor in third world countries and by third world countries in general. But the people who suffer from that climate change are, of course, also in third world countries, or mainly in third world countries. Um, yes? Uh, so it's just a random fact, but like if you know, uh, the most amount of um, pollution per person is being produced by USA and Australia, how is Lahore the most diverse city? Lahore is uh, kind of an outlier yeah. uh, in this regard because uh, um, it is one of the worst polluted, but uh, it's an outlier if we look at the third world as a whole. And there are specific reasons why um, Lahore gets so polluted in the winter, which have to do with um, 
crop burning and also emissions and so on. Both things contribute. And the weather cycle is such that the fog kind of holds that smoke in the air for much longer instead of cleaning it out. So, and the wind sort of brings the, that crop burning smoke into Lahore in a big way. Achha, so quickly here are some numbers. You can see 1990, 2001 percentage of people living in poverty. 1990, 2001 total number of people living in poverty. So sub-Saharan Africa, you can see the percentage of people living in poverty is going down, but the number of people in poverty has actually gone up. You can see big change in East Asia and Pacific, China, Vietnam, etc., etc. Huge change, in fact, both in pro proportion from 57% to below 8%. Ab ye se bhi kam ho gaya. In fact, China recently declared that they have completely, and I repeat, completely eliminated extreme poverty. Completely eliminated. So this has gone to zero. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, and you can see in terms of absolute number, it's also declining. South Asia declines, yes, uh, but uh, still very, very high in terms of the absolute and total number of poor people. Latin America, you see a decline. Europe, Middle East, etc. you don't see such a big problem. And the world as a whole, these, this is what the data points to. Still a billion people, nearly a billion people below the poverty line. Now let's turn to inequality. Um, so inequality can rise even while poverty continues to fall, which is what's happening in China, for example. And many people argue that as long as poor people are not, you know, sort of in such dire poverty, even if there's a little bit of inequality, even if there's a lot of inequality, it's okay because everybody's getting better off. So some people are getting, you know, more better off than others, but everybody's slightly better off, so it's not a good thing. Uh, so that's what trickle-down theorists, for example, say if the rich have, uh, have incentives to make money, they will innovate and produce goods that bolster wealth in society more widely, resulting in products that, when popular, become affordable for the poor and provide them with jobs in manufacturing. Inequality can be defended on the basis that the rich deserve more because they have worked harder or been entrepreneurial or that it is necessary for improving the overall wealth of a society. So many people will say, okay, oh, we shouldn't have socialism because then the incentive to generate wealth will be finished, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and capitalism, you know, uh, because it really rewards the winner. It may really kind of push down whoever is at the bottom, but whoever gets to the top gets so, uh, uber rewarded, gets ultra rewarded, gets superb rewards. So even more than you could argue, even more than they deserve perhaps, right? So they say, well, this is a big spur and incentive for people to produce more and to do better. Others argue that this inequality is owing to unjust factors, such as luck, inheritance, which class were you born in? Uh, if you're born in a certain class, you go to a good school, you go to a good school, you get your chance of getting into Ivy League are very good, you get into Ivy League, you're pretty much set. And if you're born in a, in, in a working class community and you have to work from a young age, uh, you know, there's poverty, there's problems with the, your family, brothers, sisters, etc. You're not going to have the same life chances. Also, uh, there's a lot of exploitation. I mean, we have the uh, Karl Marxist theory, which is a very powerful theory, saying that capitalism is inherently exploitative of poor people. It exploits poor people and rich people. The profit that accumulates to the capitalist is really based on the exploitation of the labor of poor people. So um, even if we were not to accept that, a growing inequality in society would also raise questions about uh, would obviously create class conflict, would undermine solidarity and uh, social capital, and uh, also would undermine democracy, which requires a degree of egalitarianism to exist. If I am so rich that I can buy anything out, uh, and you're so poor that you are desperate to get out of that poverty, desperate enough to get out of that poverty, I can pretty much get anything I want. Uh, you know, I can kill somebody and then pay blood money and be done with it. And uh, to me, that blood money might be a very small sum in comparison to the amount of money I have. But to the other person, that sum may be so huge that it may change their lives. And if you have that level of inequality, you have a very, very uh, strange situation. Oxfam tells us the world's 62 richest people own the same wealth as 3.6 billion poorest people. OK, so that's what the 62 people. And 62 people, you can fit on a bus. So the number of people you can fit on a bus have more money than 3.6 billion people. That's half the planet. 
Um, <clears throat> so what's been happening with respect to countries? Here is the per capita income uh, of different countries, etc. Uh, you can look at uh, China here, US, etc., and so on. But there has been growing inequality between countries in the period of, uh, of owing to globalization, etc. Um, of course, we have to take into account per it in per capita terms. When you look at China, for example, if you look at the overall economy, today people claim that the Chinese economy is larger than the US economy. That's in terms of purchasing power parity as well as if you don't look at population. But if you look at per cap in per capita terms, America is like the fifth richest country in the world, approximately, and China is at number 69. Huge difference, huge difference in per capita terms. So um, much of this equalization, however, is again owing to the rapid growth of China. China is one of the only countries that is actually catching up to the West. None of the other countries are catching up to the West. One very important thing to understand is a developing country with income of, let's say, $1,000 per capita. Pakistan has $1,200, $1,400, I forget the exact number. So imagine a country like Pakistan, $1,000 per capita. Uh, let's say it's growing at 6%, will not be keeping up with a developed country with income of $30,000 a year growing at 1%. So the formula is, the interesting formula is that the further behind you are, right? So if, the, if we are at 1,000 and they are at 30,000, that means they are 30 times ahead of us. That means you have to close the gap, absolute gap, you have to grow at 30 times their speed. Did you know that? So if they're growing at 1%, you have to grow at 30% to close the absolute gap. It's very difficult to do that. That's just how the numbers are placed. Because if you have a lot of money, if, if I have a lakh rupees, and I get 10% interest on lakh rupees, that's 10,000 rupees. And if you have 1,000 rupees and you get 10% interest on that, you're getting the same percent interest, but it's only 100 rupees. So, there's, so the gap between us is actually uh, increasing, even though we are both growing at the, are at the same rate. So it's not enough even to grow at the same rate. You have to grow faster than them, and many times faster than them, in order to catch up with them. And uh, sadly, that seems like an impossible thing. Um, so where is the world heading? That's the real question. OK, so next up, let's look at how uh, what's happening in terms of inequality uh, between people. Eight billionaires own the same wealth as now. The new statistic is that was 62 when I, when I told you 62 people have the same as half the people. Now, the latest statistics put together by Oxfam right here is that eight people, only eight people. You can fit eight people maybe into a large car. Okay, you can fit them into my car. It's a seven-seater car, so one person can squeeze in. Eight people can, be, can fit into one car, not even a bus. Eight people now, today in the world, own as much as 3.6 billion people in the world. Soon it's going to be the case uh, that uh, you know, one person has more money than 3.6 billion people. And then one person will have more money than, you know, I don't know, 4 billion, 5 billion, 6 billion. That's the direction in which the globe, global inequality is heading. The poorest two-thirds of the world receive less than 13% of the world's income. The richest 1% re receive nearly 15%. Half the world's wealth is owned by the richest 1%. The richest 85 people in the world hold the same as the world's poorest half. This is because this is uh, Martel's work from 2015. It's out of date. It's worse today. Okay? This is the statistic today. That's why I put it in. Right? But I just thought... Um, um, so inequality at a global scale is exploding. It is exploding and it is getting worse because their income is growing much faster than our income. Here is an example. Um, since 1995, the top 1% have captured nearly 20 times more of the global wealth than the bottom 50% of humanity. So not, it's not just that they're growing faster than we are. It's not just, sorry, it's not just that they have a bigger fortune and they're growing at the same rate. It's they have a bigger fortune and they're growing at an exponential rate in comparison to us. So global inequality is on some other scale altogether. Countries that are growing as a consequence of uh, globaliz globalization, etc. China, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, India, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Dominican Republic, Mauritius, Poland, and Turkey. Latin America as a whole, Africa as a whole, 
South Asia, other countries in South Asia have not, with the exception of Bangladesh recently, have not been doing so well. Okay, so women are drawn into production in this process of globalization, but mainly they are drawn into low wage jobs. They are often migrant workers, they work in, uh, in other people's homes as domestic workers. They often work in childcare in rich countries. International labor migration of women has overtaken that of men because of the entry of women into jobs such as nursing, nannying, domestic, domestic work, catering, and waitering. So interestingly, uh, in terms of international visas, for work visas, etc., women get a lot more visas than men e even do. But mainly, that's, these are the kind of jobs, care, care jobs, in other words. Women go to the US, they go to Central and South America, sorry, they come from places like Central and South America, they come from the Philippines, Sri Lanka, North Africa, Caribbean, etc. Women also go in a huge number into sex work, sometimes through human trafficking with workers that are trapped sometimes by coercion, debt, or stigma. Um, and of course, there's also sex work in uh, third world countries itself. We discussed some of that in the last class. More women have broken into new professions. There's also a micro lending in NGOs and so on in the development sector, and uh, they do tend to hire a lot of women. Globalization has led to the employment of women in poorer countries, uh, but the labor, uh, because a lot of employers think that if they hire women, they are less likely to form trade unions and you know, fight and go on strike and break things and so on and so forth. Uh, they'll be less militant, they think, but um, uh, this has meant bad working conditions, often insecure employment, uh, long working hours that are part-time work, temporary work, flexible work, casual work, home-based work, poorly unionized work, and uh, low-paid work, often demeaning work accompanied by health problems, etc. Also, there's the problem of the double burden. Despite the fact that women take these jobs, they still have to come home and take care of the baby. And sometimes the baby includes the husband. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, uh, globalization, sadly, is not accompanied by a redistribution of domestic responsibilities. So when the Aurat March, for example, says, Ki khana kade khud bhi garam kar lea karo, so that's what is being argued here. It's being argued that domestic responsibilities ought to be reshifted, rebalanced, recalibrated, given also that so many women are now out and about and working in, the, in factories and other places. And, uh, so on, so at, they cannot be saddled with both these things. So there has also been, in, in this period of globalization, what we call the feminization of unemployment. Because it's also the case, by the way, that when a factory sort of is in trouble, the first people they get rid of is, are women. Um, they, you know, the, the senior staff will be, often be men, the junior staff will often be women, they'll get they unemploy the women, etc. So that also is a, uh, is a trend that we've often seen. Domestic work. Domestic work is pretty, can be sometimes pretty scary because the person who's working in someone else's home is isolated there. There's no trade union, there's nobody even, there's no other second person there aside from the family itself. So what that can mean is that they can be working, worked very long hours, uh, they can face, uh, you know, other forms of harassment or other forms of exploitation or very bad working conditions that are unregulated. And that can often happen. I don't know if you've ever seen, picked up the newspaper and you read all the time, that in Saudi Arabia, flana flana Filipino maid was beat up and then, you know, thrown out and so on and so forth. Horrific. And in Pakistan, too, it happens all the time. We hear about it all. I mean, we don't even hear about it often enough. But it happens all the time. Vaktan for vaktan, you keep reading in newspapers, things like this. When I was uh, about your age, uh, uh, there was a very famous incident, in fact, in uh, what is Makkah colony, uh, which is where the Jinnah flyover is. It wasn't there before that. Uh, there was just a railway line, and there's a Kachi Abadi along that railway line, which is called Makkah colony. There's Makkah and Medina colony. And there's a girl from there who used to go work at a brigadier's ho house, and um, she got uh, one day the car came and just threw her, etc. And she said that she had been raped, and uh, the um, uh, by the you know uh, well by the son or whatever of, of the person that she was working for. The whole Makkah colony got up and they blocked the the uh, uh, railway line, 
they brought their majjas out and you know gaye shay nikal ke unhone unko block kar diya us zamane mein obviously there was no jina flyover so the railway had to be stopped until the brigadier came apologized and so on paid some uh, you know compensation etc etc uh, it's a pretty big deal i wrote a play on that called lok raj people's rule uh, you know uh, so because i used to live close to makka colony and i used to visit often so that's an example of how domestic work can often be very very tricky also cuts to state funding and reductions in social services that are often accompanied by globalization hit women harder because often if education healthcare facilities are being taken away and women are caring for the children etc they will often go to work in order to take care of the children um, because these social spendings are have been stopped so is globalization the solution i put this uh, picture in because although they are actually obviously not praying to coca cola and so on but the picture just makes it look like that right it's just a funny picture obviously this they're praying that way but just the perspective of the picture makes it look like that so is globalization the solution should we be praying to globalization sort of what i want to say with this picture for the world bank globalization is the solution it although they do recognize that it comes with prop, its own problems etc but on the whole they feel that it increases competitiveness promotes investment and decreases poverty there's a very important study by dollar and K and cray which looks at 100 countries the data from 100 countries it looks at trade and then looks at what is happening to poverty and what it concludes is that the more countries are trading the more they're increasing their trading the more likely they are to reduce poverty and uh, and this that study is done over 100 countries so it's very very uh, comprehensive but there's been a lot of criticism of this study as well rodrick and summon for example say that um, they they selected 100 if you if you take their criteria and apply it correctly and uh, it include some countries that they I do, we don't know why excluded and exclude some countries that do not actually meet their criteria what you discover is that the results actually are the reverse so basically the argument is that they are messing with the sample it's not really a randomly chosen proper sample and that in fact the data does not prove what they're trying to prove they they're fudging the data to prove what they're trying to prove second thing that they second point that they make is that to look to estimate globalization they use trade so if trade they look at the relationship of trade and poverty but trade is not necessarily a good indicator of globalization what would be a better indicator of globalization is whether or not the country has high or low tariff barriers etc so they didn't look at that they looked at trade so because they may have very high tariff barriers but they may still have a lot of trade in other words they may be not be globalizers and have trade for other reasons than uh, that and they may not be a very liberal and open economy um uh, but they may still have very high trade and that is the case with certain countries certain very important countries so that's the other major argument does trade cause growth or does growth cause trade so uh, that's the other point they make is that you're reversing the cause and effect actually these countries may sometimes have protected their economy grown and once they grew then they went into international trade and traded in a big way so and they have evidence for that as well for instance uh, india went through a long period of protection very recently only has opened up same story with china it also very only very recently opened up and it also opened up in a very selective kind of way it didn't completely open up unlike pakistan also also they say we've got to distinguish between levels or increases in tariffs or trade so uh, there may be an increase in the tariff but the tariff may be very low so if there's even a double increase in the tariff if the tariff is so low it's still quite irrelevant if your tariff was at 1% and you raise it at 2% that's a 100% you know in uh, raise but it's just still only at 2% versus if your tariff was already at 60% and you raised it by 10% you went all the way to 70% that may look like a smaller uh, raise but actually you know the absolute level at which you are controlling the economy is much higher so this is another confusion in the study they also point out that there may be other factors be behind growth for example geography and institutional factors somebody discovers oil somebody else discovers diamonds or gas etc communications transport become better so the institution the context of geography changes institutions change revolutions occur new governments come into being etc etc that can create make very very important and big changes and last but not least all right maybe they're even growing 
but is that growth really benefiting the poor? Is it helping to reduce the poorest of the poor? If you look at the bottom one-fifth, you might come to the conclusion that things are slightly better, but that's a very big average number. There are many people who are falling below in that bottom one-fifth, and if you look at the, you know, if you look at really the lowest 10 percent of people, they are in dire and extreme poverty, and, the, and things are not improving for them at all. So, are the globalizers globalizers? Really globalizers. An economy can be globalized in many different ways, he says. We're coming to the end. I know you're probably uh, feeling a bit tired now, uh, but not to worry, just to show you that we truly are coming to an end. You can see there's only three more slides, okay? Oops. So, <laughs> an economy can, now this is very important. An economy can be globalized, and this partially answers the question you were asking. He says in many different ways. For example, you can lower tariffs. You can do more trade in imports or exports. So you can say, we want more imports, or we don't want more imports, we want more exports. Or more FDI, either outwards or inwards, growing through increases in exports while being quite closed in terms of tariffs and imports, or being open in terms of investment, more than uh, goods moving in or out. Or you can be open to some kinds of investments and close to other kinds of investments, etc. So there isn't this one solution, sort of one size fits all in terms of globalization. Although that is what structural adjustment policies and the Washington consensus did. What the IMF did was one policy for everybody, just throw all the tariffs out, etc. But we can see that countries perhaps that were more intelligent about the way in which they engaged with globalization uh, did better. Because they gauged whether which industries to open, how to open them, to what extent to open, to whom to open them to, uh, and uh, what kind of things to open? Should we open trade, investment, blah, blah, blah? All of these questions have to be examined in more careful detail. China, South Korea, Taiwan, and Vietnam have gained from integration into the global economy and strong export orientation, but they also placed restrictions on foreign investment, subsidized exports, and had tariffs and non-tariff barriers on imports. Rather than the state being rolled back, it intervened to pick and choose where and how growth could be facilitated. State actually plays and played a key role in the way in which China and Vietnam engaged with the global economy. Picking out bit by bit what they would do and what they would not do. No blanket policy. They were like, okay, what do we do with telecommunications? Let's study what is the situation and then devise a policy according to that and so on and so forth, right? So that's how they approached it rather than, okay, let's just open up and see what happens. They didn't do it that way, okay? Hello? Off of here? Okay. So, moreover, successes from globalization have been selected. There have been some successes. East Asia, especially China, is a success story. But Latin America is not. The Caribbean and Sub-Saharan Africa is not. They saw losses in their market share of manufacturing, as did Eastern Europe is not. Russia is not. Um, most of Central Europe, uh, after the fall of socialism, etc., have become poorer and also more unequal. So they've become, their economies have gone down. At the same time, they've had greater inequality. Um, Latin American countries have had a mixed record. Hence, those who have been successful or hope to be, there are many explanations other than globalization. There are many factors that are at play here that we have to disaggregate and try and understand. And that's where he really would like us to conclude. But before that, just one uh, important slide here. What are the alternatives to globalization? Well, the um, official development assistance from the Development Assistance Committee of the OECD countries totals 135 billion, that was in 2014, it's obviously much more now. The UN target for ODA is 0.7% of GNI, but most OECD DAC members do not meet this. So they have to give 0.7% of their GNI, that's gross national income, to the Development Assistance Fund, which they don't give. Um, the average, in fact, it has to be 0.7, it's actually closer to 0.3. And only five members out of 28 actually met the 0.5 target. Of the total ODA, which is at 135 billion, only 25 billion uh, was to least developed countries in 2014. Uh, so much of it is not given where it is most needed. You would expect, for example, that out of 135 billion, 100 billion would be going to the least developed countries, but somehow that's not the case. So quite 
a lot of criticism here as well about what's really going on. All right, now to conclude, tiring day, you had a quiz, and now after that, such a long lecture, but here we go. Alternative form of globalization fared by the global justice movement is trade on a fair trade basis. Aaj kisi ne poster bhi pakda hua tha at the demonstration, something about fairness, etc., in trade, etc., ethical uh, trade, etc. Secondly, some advocate greater localism and self-sufficiency for economic reasons as well as for environmental reasons. Why are we getting stuff all the way from elsewhere when we can also make it here? It doesn't have to be that you get it from abroad, etc. Regionalist protectionists and assistance with some industries would help more than open competition with no protection. So regionalism means it's important for us to trade around the region. What about trade with Iran and India? Why don't we trade with India, for example? We could never trade with India because they're our enemies, right? But, <laughs> but from the economic point of view, it would make sense. It would make a lot of sense, uh, et cetera. And of, obviously trade with Iran and the Middle East, et cetera. Um, and uh, also to be selectively protectionist, that would enable poorer countries to compete uh, with first trade with countries that, are, you, that they can compete with. And then as they get better and better, then open up to countries that are richer and more competitive. So first, don't open up to the first world, arguably. Open up to your region. South-South linkages, South-South trade should be strengthened. And then later, as your economy picks up and you become more and more efficient, as you become stronger, then you can fight, uh, compete with, sorry, not fight, but compete with um, the stronger economies. Think about it this way. Like, uh, anybody into boxing or wrestling or mixed martial arts or karate or judo or any other contact sport? Nobody? You? What? What, what sport? Football. Foot okay, all right, all right. Well, that's not really not a good thing. I mean, it's a great thing. I'm a footballer, but uh, that's not a good example for what I'm trying to say. Let's say box. Let's take boxing. Just you know boxing, right? In boxing, you have different weight classes, right? You have a flyweight, and you have a uh, you know middleweight, and then you have a heavyweight and super heavyweight, etc. You don't get a flyweight boxer to go up against Muhammad Ali or uh, Mike Tyson, who's a heavyweight boxer. You just don't do that. Why? Because they're going to get destroyed completely. In wrestling, also, you have weight classes in which you compete only in your own weight class. So economically speaking, why don't you compete out of your weight class? Because you'll get bludgeoned. It will be a really one-way fight. Because if somebody is at uh, 250 pounds and you are at 120 pounds, it's not really a fair fight. OK, let me tell you. So, and this sports people know this from experience. What about, the, take that as a metaphor for the economy. If we are a 120 pound weakling, you don't want to enter the international market with somebody who's a 250 pound, you know, super heavyweight champion who can produce the things that you produce at a quarter of the price at which you produce them. You'll get knocked out of the market. You'll get destroyed, bloody, bludgeoned. So it's better to fight first in your class, to compete first in your own class. I'll give you another example. If class se yaad aagya. Uh, I mean, this is the reason why we have 100 level and 200 level and 300 level and 400 level. And you often say, sir, maybe there are too many seniors in your class. And I don't want to take your class because there are too many seniors and I'm just a sophomore, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Uh, why don't you do that? Uh, because you realize, Ke, oh, this guy's older than me. He's had two more years of cognitive development and college experience or three more years of that. And if I go into this class of full of seniors, I might not be able to do so well. So yeah, it makes sense for you to... To, to stay uh, you know, at your own level, you'll do better. By the way, in sports, this happens all the time. You play football, right? If you're not a very good footballer, uh, if you're starting out at football, you don't go and start playing with the best team in the whatever. You'll get discouraged. You won't ever get the ball, in fact. <laughs> you won't, nobody will pass to you because you're so bad, right? <laughs> Achha, by the way, the same thing happens. Uh, you know, the, by the way, the same thing happens with children who are in school. So if you have somebody in, you know, like parents, when we were kids, I don't know if they still do it. When we were kids, what parents would do is they would lie about their children's age. So they would put a child in class one, and he was supposed to be five years old, but the actual child was six years old. But they would say, no, no, he's just a little grown up, but he is actually five years old. So the, that boy would be six, and we would be five. 
And between when you're six years old and when you're five years old, there's just a huge difference in cognitive ability and in strength. So then when we would go out to play sports, if you were younger, you would get your butt kicked <laughs> by the six-year-old, right? You couldn't compete. And uh, let me tell you one interesting thing uh, from, which, which comes from that. Did you know uh, that wonderful book uh, called Tipping Point, written by Malcolm, whatever his name was, shows that the vast majority of sportsmen are born in January, February, March, April. There's very few sportsmen who are born top, top sportsmen, top in the world, who are born in September or December or November and so on. Why? Does January just make you more athletic or something? No. The kids born in January were older than the kids born in September by six, seven, eight months. They did better in school in sports. They, became, they got the ball passed to them more often. They were more encouraged to play because they were playing better. And because over 20, 30 years of playing you know, and continuously playing, etc., they got more opportunity to play. And just because they got more opportunity to play, they became better at sports. And they became sportsmen. So moral of the story here is maybe it's better to compete in your own class rather than to get wiped out by a stronger player in the economy. Competitive growth can be achieved on, the, on a more realistic basis of trading on equal terms with similar economies rather than with much richer ones where the playing field is not a level playing field. In sum, he says, what we've got to think of perhaps is his view, may or may not be your view, is selective engagement and disengagement with the global economy in a gradual way. Don't just open up, don't just close, up, close down. Selective engagement and go slow. Figure out what you're going to do, look at the market, study it, get your think tanks to sit down and say, where can I compete and actually move the economy forward? Maybe that's what China did. Thank you.